you once again to the uh, second session that uh, we have today. We had listened to Dr. Sony Joseph on active listening. We are continuing with the same skill. And uh, I would now like to introduce the resource person for this second session. Uh, he is uh, an eminent person, Professor Ajit K. Misra. Uh, he has his PhD in African American studies from Banaras Hindu University. And at present, he is working as uh, an associate professor in the Department of Humanistic Studies at uh, IIT Varanasi in BHU. His uh, research interests include narrative studies, visual culture, research communication, as well as humanistic communication. He has been an institutional as well as a corporate trainer in the areas of research communication, management communication, and health communication. He finds it very enjoyable when he is interacting as well as learning from you know, the audience, from the multitude. He has conducted several technical sessions on research writing, pedagogical strategies, research communication in various faculty development programs, short term courses and workshop. Uh, and he has been uh, extremely gracious to accept our invitation. He was uh, there one, you know, right from the planning stage of this workshop. Uh, Professor Mishra was there uh, with us. And though we had to you know, change the dates and all, uh, sir was very, very accommodative and uh, you know, always uh, willing to go by uh, whatever uh, changes in the schedules that uh, we had to make. I'm extremely happy to welcome Professor Misra to this session. Uh, I request uh, Mr. Sir to now uh, take over the session. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Zakaria. Uh, good morning to you and to good morning to everyone present there. Uh, so thank you for those kind words with which you uh, introduced me. I do not know how much of those words I actually deserve. So fine, words are words, but actions are more important. So we'll see. Uh, whether at the end of this session we return to our respective places uh, wiser or not. So that's, and that's more important. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, everyone. Hello, out there. Good morning. Yeah. Yes, good morning to all of you. Uh, hello, so, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning sir. Sir, uh, sir. Sir, you have a sir. Good morning, sir. Sir, your mic is muted, sir. Yeah, the good morning yeah. is on now. Uh, so let's move to the next segment. Okay. So. I'll be talking about a few uh, very interesting and important things that you will be requiring when you become a professional. And most of you are professionals, I uh, have been told by Professor Zakaria. And rightly so, because you all are uh, taking a professional course and uh, you are aiming at a professional career. So when that happens, you will be needing a few very important skills so that you can navigate the professional sphere uh, with utmost ease. And that's the reason why, um, you know, I'll be, I'll be walking you through the world of professional uh, scenarios where certain important skills are required. In the first session today, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, Professor Joseph uh, talked about uh, active listening. Uh, am I right? You can write in the chat box instead of unmuting yourself. You can write in the chat box, active listening skills. Did Professor Joseph talk about? Uh, let me make it very clear at the beginning that I'm going to keep it very, very interactive, as much interactive as it can be. Uh, so, uh, and uh, you can uh, write your responses in the chat box through the session. So, did he talk about active listening skills? Please uh, respond uh, in yes or no. 
And did uh, Professor uh, Joseph uh, talk about uh, active listening skills? So actually, chat box is chat box is not available. Yeah, I think it's available. Yes, that's what uh, I have been informed by the organizers that Professor. No, I think so. Yes, Professor Joseph uh, would be talking about uh, active listening skills. Fine, I'll be uh, looking at uh, the other aspects of listening skills that most people generally do not talk about or we, we do not take care of. We tend to ignore those skills. And uh, I'm, I'm very sure at the end of today's uh, session, you'll get to know, you'll get to learn something new, something interesting and something important and which you will pursue yet further. So that's the plan for this session. So allow me a few uh, uh, seconds so that I can share my screen with you and then we'll start. I think my screen is visible to you now. Professor Zakaria, can you please confirm? Yes, sir. It is yes, sir. Good. Yeah, right. Uh, so I want all the participants to keep their hands down uh, during the session. Uh, I'll be I'll be talking about a few important things for a few uh, minutes thereafter. Uh, we will uh, take up your questions, your queries uh, related to those uh, things that I discuss. Okay. So now uh, is my uh, slide visible to everyone? Professor Zakaria, can you please confirm? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. All right, it's listening for workplace yes, success. Okay. So do you think listening is very, very important for workplace success? I mean, it's, of course, important for our life, our existence, and for communication, of course. But do you also think that listening is very important for workplace success? So you can uh, write responses in the chat box quickly. A few, just a few. Do you think... It is important for workplace success. I, I can I can understand it's quite obvious. Most of you would write yes, it is it is important. Some of you might think it is not important. You have every right to say that. So most of you uh, would definitely go with the idea that it is very important for workplace success. So that's exactly what I'm going to do in this session. I'll be walking you through the world of listening and how it is important for workplace success. We'll start with a very short activity, all right? And uh, a brief one to check. So how do you imagine your workplace? Right? Let's start. You can uh, post your responses in the chat box. How do you imagine your workplace? Some of you are already working in workplaces, some others are you know, aiming to land there, and you'll be reaching those workplaces very, very soon. So how do you uh, imagine your workplace? For example, if I uh, ask you to draw an image or a picture of your workplace, what things would you take into account? Uh, supportive uh, colleagues, uh, And uh, you, can, you can post your responses on the chat box only, so please do not raise your hands during the session. So supportive colleagues is one response. Any other? Whenever you think of a workplace, what things come to your mind? So many employees working together, right. And then? Friendly environment, of course, right. Right, punctuality, collaborative place, that's the environment, the ecosystem in which you will work or you are working. Uh, work in harmony or collaboration, discipline. Right, right. That's fine, that's fine. You may stop posting your responses now. I'll take you back to uh, that. So, I mean, if I have to uh, collate your responses and then find these commonalities. The first thing is people whom you would call colleagues. You'll definitely find people 
because you cannot imagine a workplace. That's the reason why I've used this image so that you can draw some clues out of it. The first thing that you'll see are people. Then the ecosystem, the environment in which you'll be asked to work, will be placed. And the third that none of you actually pointed towards is transactions. So these are the three most important things that we generally come across or generally think of whenever we are asked to imagine the workplace. We have to work with people because it cannot be that you are the only person working in that workplace. That way you cannot call it a workplace. Okay, because you cannot work in isolation. You will be working alongside and with people. You'll be cooperating, collaborating. You'll be you know, transacting with people. You'll be working with them. Then you need a proper environment. It has to be a very friendly uh, you know, uh, environment that develops a sense of belongingness in you so that you feel like becoming a part of your workplace. And the third, and probably the most important one, that is transactions. What happens in a workplace? You have people, you have the environment, you have placed people in that ecosystem or environment, but what after that? How will the work take place? Why do we call it a workplace? The work can only happen, the work can take place only when we have transactions. So the third aspect of it, the third aspect of the workplace is the most important. I don't say that people or environment are not important, they're equally important. But once we have people and environment, what else do we need to make it a workplace of success, workplace of satisfaction? We need transactions. And that's exactly where all kinds of communication skills, your speaking, reading, writing, listening, you know, all kinds of communication, your language skills, your paralanguage skills, your body language, all kinds of communication skills come into play when it comes to transactions. So transactions are the things that you need to be quite aware of and familiar with. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about in this session. I'll be gradually walking you through the world of transactions today. And then I'll, I'll show you how listening plays a very, very important role in transactions. Since Professor Joseph uh, must have talked about listening, active listening, various types of listening skills, and their importance to your professional success and personal um, success as well. So I'm not going to you know, deal with any of these aspects. Transactions, okay? There are a few questions that we all need to start with whenever we think of listening skills or listening for workplace success. There are a couple of questions that we need to answer first before we can seriously think about the role of listening in workplace success. Of course, listening also plays a very, very important role in your personal success. But then right now we are talking about workplace success, so we'll restrict our discussion to workplace success only. So the first question is this. Do you talk when others are talking? That means somebody is talking to you. Do you talk when the other person is talking? Or do you have the patience to wait for your turn? That means, are you an out of turn speaker? The first question that you need to answer in yes, no, or sometimes it can be maybe, maybe I talk when others are talking. So the moment you find an answer to this question, your initiative begins. You think about it. Is it right? Is it good for me to talk when the other person is talking? Except for discourse markers. While talking, by talking, I do not mean the use of discourse markers. We do use discourse markers. Some of them are, you know, visual discourse markers. Some of them are, you know, audible discourse markers, like, okay, I see, hmm, right. All right, so these are discourse markers. So we, we are free to use these discourse markers because that is how the communication will go on. Otherwise, it will come to an abrupt end. But then, 
if you're talking, if you're using more words than just the discourse markers, then you need to review your response to other speakers, the speech situation. The second question is, do you often have to ask people to repeat themselves? For example, you're attending a board meeting and then at the end of it, when the you know, convener of that meeting asks you to sum up or asks you to give your response to one particular aspect, one particular element or point, you, you say, um, uh, can you please repeat what you said uh, while uh, you are presenting your ideas? So that, that will mean that you were not attentive, you're not listening to the person carefully. So you need to answer this question. Do you do this often? Do you often ask people to repeat themselves or you're listening to them carefully? The third is, do you often interrupt others when they are talking? For example, interrupting by saying that, okay, okay, I, I know somebody who also has a similar problem. Okay, I have also faced a similar problem. Let me, let me now tell you about it. So you have not allowed the other person complete what he or she wants to say wants to communicate. That way, you will be doing a disfavor to the other person. The other person will feel very bad, hurt, and the other person will lose trust on you. Because listening is one of the most important activities that ultimately leads to the building of trust. It is not about exchanging information. It is not about gathering information. Of course, it is. But it's not all about gathering information or exchanging information. It is more about building trust. Somebody, uh, for example, a child runs to the mother and says, mother, I fell down. The mother says, don't disturb me. I'm, I'm busy in cooking or I'm busy watching a television show. The child will feel very, very hurt because the child has that trust on the mother. Therefore, the child ran to the mother with a problem. Now the mother is not a good listener. Therefore, the child will return with a dropped face and a hurt feeling. And that will definitely affect the, the growth and the personality and thereafter the behavior of the child. So trust building is the most important thing. If you remember, you talked about uh, uh, environment. When I asked you to imagine your office, your workplace, most of you said environment. It has to be a very friendly environment. What do you mean by your friendly environment? It has trust. Where there is no trust, no friendly environment is possible. So in order to make it friendly, you need to build that trust. If you, you know, continuously interrupt people, that trust will never be built. So this is the third important thing that we need to ask ourselves in order to test whether we listen or not. And then do I let my feelings for the speaker interfere with my listening ability? For example, sometimes, you know, even before we attend the first class of a certain teacher in college, we, we generally form a bias, a prejudice. Oh, just look at the person, how the person looks. I don't think the person will be interesting. So let's not listen to the person. So even before you have listened to the person, you have you know, formed a bias towards the person. Do we do that? If we do that, we need to review that approach. So, so that we do not start with any bias, any prejudice for the speaker. Okay, we may not like the person. We may not like the person. But if the person has to say something important, something meaningful, then we have to give space to the person, we have to listen to the person. For example, there are many people in a, uh, in a, in a workplace, in an organization, who may not like the boss, who may not like their colleagues. But then when it comes to working on a project, you need to work with those colleagues. You don't have an option. So we have to mend our ways. We may not like the person uh, on a personal note, but then we have to develop some kind of compatibility with the person on a professional note. So it's not a good idea to let our feelings for a speaker interfere with our listening. And then, do I jump to conclusions before the speaker is finished talking? 
I mean, this happens, you know, this also ha happened most often uh, whenever we find uh, uh, exam question papers. There are certain questions that we have prepared answers to and we jump. Before we have read the entire question, we jump to a conclusion, we start writing the answer by reading just one part of the question paper or one part of the question. And later on, we realize that the question had a twist. It did not exactly ask us to write what we wrote. Then you regret your decision of not reading the question paper completely or the question completely. A similar thing happens when we are listening to other people. Even before they have finished speaking, we jump to conclusions. So we develop that tendency. And that's the reason why um, the, the, the speech situation, the communication situation, you know, gets completely uh, destroyed. It doesn't lead to any uh, positive or productive results. So it's never a good idea to jump to conclusions before somebody has finished. So these are the five most important questions that, that we can ask uh, our SAMs in order to test whether we are doing proper listening or not. Then we need to ask these things to check whether we use these tools or these approaches, these attitudes while listening. Another set of questions. Do we use what is very popularly known as statement blockers? For example, I am speaking. Do you suddenly interrupt and use a statement blocker? No, oh, you had better done that. You have better taken care of yourself. You should have done this. While the other person is saying, speaking, you're using statement blockers. It doesn't really matter whether you felt bad about it or not. You're, you're blocking the statements. By blocking the statements, you're just showing your hand. I don't care. I mean, the moment we show our hand in this manner, the, uh, the attitude is, I give a damn or I don't care. I don't bother. So these are, I mean, this is symbolic of I don't care, I don't bother, I give a damn. Okay. That means these are statement blockers. You're blocking the communication by not listening, by not allowing the person to speak and by not allowing yourself to listen because you have used a blocker in between. So the entire communication process is blocked. So if we use such statements, then we need to review these statements, the statement blockers. There are several other statement blockers, okay, that we need to think about. And then do we also use interrupters? There are certain interrupters, like there are certain statement blockers. Interrupters. Oh, well, I know, I know this. Um, listen to what happened to me in that situation. The person is saying something that I, I was in the railway station, I was at the railway station where my uh, pocket was picked, or I was pickpocketed. I say, okay, do you know? Um, uh, I had a similar situation and now listen to me. So what are you doing? You're actually interrupting the person from completing his or her experience and you are superimposing your own experience on the person. The person will feel that you don't care for the person. You have no care, you have no empathy for the feelings of that person. So it is always a good idea to let the person finish so that you can say, do you know I had a similar experience? Okay, so interrupters and the third type, poor responders. Do you use poor responders? Like, for example, there's an example. Uh, this example has not been created by my, me. It, it's taken from an internet source. So you can think of similar examples. Yes. The speaker says, I'm feeling really overworked and stressed. The listener says, have you seen my keys? You imagine what kind of communication situation is that? There's a very poor response because the listener has used a poor responder. I give you the example of the child running to the mother with a problem. The mother said, I'm watching the television now. That was a poor responder. The child is 
you know, trying to say something. The child wants to have some support. The child wants somebody who can understand the problem and lend support. Similarly, in this situation, the speaker wants that the listener lends some support, understands. And then, you know, by lending or extending some support, the listener can help the speaker overcome or find a way to overcome that problem. That's stress, which has resulted from working hard or overworking. But then see, have you seen my keys? Now, as if you don't at all care. And that is how this, this symbol, this hand, becomes very, very important. I mean, do we use these blockers, these interrupters, these poor responders? So if we use these poor responders, we need to review. If somebody says, I have a problem, if I have to you know, build trust, I have to give some space, some time to the person. And especially when it's about our colleagues, we have to, because we're going to spend a considerable amount of time with our colleagues working in the same workplace. So we cannot afford to adopt these responses, like the blockers, interrupters, and poor responders. We cannot afford to um, adopt these responses. So we need to think about such responses. We need to ask these questions to ourselves before we are ready for the workplace. And then some more questions. You have some you know, associated and related images. You can imagine, you can guess uh, what I'm going to talk about. So just to help you, you know, go for some informed, educated guess, I've used these images. Do you experience these things at the workplace? Lack of confidence? We need to ask this question to ourselves because there is every possibility Every time you conduct a survey on employees or workers, you'll find that most of them experience lack of confidence, owing to certain reasons. There are several reasons because of which most employees experience lack of confidence. Lack of self-respect. Do you think that there is no respect for you in the workplace? Your colleagues don't respect you? Your colleagues don't treat you as important? That, that leads to lack of confidence? Do you also experience the need to please others than the need to please yourself at the expense of your own you know, respect, confidence, your own happiness, gratification? Do you please others? So do you experience peer pressure and you do things just because of peer pressure and you don't like um, you enjoy, you don't enjoy doing those things, but you do those things just because of peer pressure. So if uh, we are experiencing either of these or all of these, we need to stop and think because there's a big problem. There's a big problem because of which we are not succeeding in the workplace because there's some problem uh, related to our listening or the listening of others. When I said listening for communication skills, it is about listening oneself and listening by others. So listening all across. It's not about listening oneself. So listening by others as well. So all these things are very, very important when it comes to this. All these things happen because of these two biases, prejudices, conformity bias, we don't have any other option but to conform to the prescribed rules and regulations. Conformity bias. And then compliance bias. If you do not conform to the group behavior, to the group norm, you're out. You're an outsider, an outcast. If you do not comply with the standard procedures, you are also out. Because of these two biases, people generally fall into the trap of these things. Low confidence or lack of confidence, lack of self-respect, and then the need to please others, that is the loss of self-esteem, the loss of motivation. And then finally, you're doing things that you do not feel like doing just because of peer pressure. You know how often this happens. You have listened 
your peers, your friends talking about something and you suddenly feel if I also don't, you know, confirm my participation in those things, I'll be out. For example, your friends are talking about going to a certain place. And then you come back home and you seek the permission of your parents so that you can also join your group, your friends to go to that place. If they don't allow your permission, you'll be extremely hurt because you'll be losing both ways. You have lost the respect of your parents, the acceptance of your parents. You have also lost the respect of your group, your friends and their acceptance. So most often we do things just because of peer pressure. We don't feel like doing this. But if somebody is experiencing any of these problems, any of these issues or all of these issues, the person needs to sit down and think about it. Now I'll start with why listening is so very important for, I mean, all these situations. I, I, until now, I have talked about problems. I've talked about issues. I have talked about questions that we need to ask ourselves, especially um, if we want to be successful at the workplaces. Now, there are two very important things uh, we need to do. There are two very important listening strategies. I'll not be talking about listening types or listening styles even. I'll be talking about listening strategies. A strategy is an approach that we adopt in order to address an immediate problem. So we need to adopt certain strategies in order to overcome these issues. Because these issues can ruin our chances, our life in the workplace. The first is, do you listen to yourself? Most often people do not think about it. By listening, we mean somebody else is speaking and we are listening. By listening, we mean we are gathering information. We are forming opinion. By listening, we mean we understand the feeling of the other person. That is empathetic listening. But we generally do not think about listening to oneself. That is self-listening. So another set of questions that we ask ourselves is or are, do you listen to yourself? If your answer is, I mean, I'm not going to uh, ask you to write your answers in the chat box, but you can check it with yourself. Do you listen to yourself? If you listen to yourself, what are the occasions when you listen to yourself? And then what kind of things you tell yourself? And when you listen to yourself, what do you do? What is the result of that listening? What kind of activities does listening such listening lead you to perform? So, you know, several questions. Uh, I think somebody's mic is uh, left open, I think. Somebody's mic is unmuted. So, Professor Zakaria? Yeah, thank you. Please participants, uh, mute your mics. So, fine, thank you. The noise is gone now. So, that's, that's the question. If you do not listen to yourself, why do people not listen to themselves? Because they don't have that confidence to listen to themselves. The reason is they are surrounded by negative self-thoughts. They are surrounded. When a person has negative self-thoughts, these negative self-thoughts act as a blocker. The person can never listen to oneself. So we need to check whether we have negative self-thoughts. What do I think about myself? Do I respect myself? If I don't respect myself, who else will? If I don't trust myself or me, then who else will? If I'm not honest with myself, who else will? So it all begins with listening to oneself. So the worst kind of disconnection or connection issue that can happen is this. The connection that gets lost between a person and the self. Losing connection with oneself is the worst kind of connection issue or disconnection that one can experience. 
So if a person has lots of negative self-thoughts, we have to think about ways to come out of those negative self-thoughts. I mean, what are those negative self-thoughts that we generally you know, experience in our workplace? For example, Mr. X is so smart. I'm not. Mr. X uh, uh, is, you know, uh, conducts himself or, uh, you know, so well, I can't. Mr. X is so intelligent, I'm not. So you begin to compare yourself with others by taking into account their abilities, not your abilities. And that's exactly when people lose connection or contact with themselves. And they judge themselves on the basis of the abilities or the strengths of others. Such a thing happens every day at every household. Parents tell their children, look at uh, Mr. Joseph's uh, son, how nicely he's doing in his class and what are you doing? Okay, poor parents, they have never tried to find out or discover the strength of their child. They are comparing the strength of a child with the strength of somebody else. So that's, that's exactly what happens in workplaces. We begin to compare ourselves with the strength of others. See what a kind of injustice we do to ourselves. So it may happen that I have my own strengths, which the other person doesn't have, but we don't compare. Whenever we offer a comparison, we use the strength of others as a parameter. And that leads to negative self thoughts, loss of confidence, loss of self-esteem, respect for oneself. So the best way to come out of it is to go for self-discovery. Listen to yourself. So the listening to yourself strategy is one of the most important strategies. Understand your strengths. How often people conduct SWOT analysis. There was a time when people used to call this SWOT analysis. You all are familiar with SWOT analysis, but how often people actually conduct SWOT analysis? How often people sit down with a piece of paper or with a notebook and then write down their strengths, their weaknesses, their you know challenges, their opportunities, their threats, you know, SWOT check. How often people do that? How often people apply the Johari window on themselves? All these concepts are just meant for you know learning about and then forgetting and never applying to our lives. So people generally do not conduct self-assessment, self, you know, tests. That doesn't lead to self-awareness, self-discovery, or self-learning. And then how will somebody discover one's strengths? So it's very important that we, we need to listen to our strengths. We need to listen to the negative self-thoughts. We need to listen to the strengths. What is my strength? I ask. The external person asks, what is my strength? And the internal person answers, this is my strength. When that happens, you know there's a proper communication between the two persons inside you. So that's very, very important how often we are kind to ourselves. There, there have been several surveys conducted to find out whether somebody is kind to oneself or not. And most often these surveys have found that people, most people, especially professionals, they generally taunt themselves, rebuke, scold themselves. What a stupid I am. I'm an idiot. I don't know what to do this. I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, I'm this, and all negative thoughts. So this reminds me of a wonderful concept that was, uh, I mean, developed by Thomas Harris. The title of the book, I'm okay, you're okay. Are you familiar with this? This I'm okay and you're okay thing? Quickly, let me know. Are you familiar with this? I'm okay, you're okay. Uh, you can write in the chat box. 
Are you familiar with this concept? I'm okay, you're okay? Uh, you can write in yes or no. Just let me know whether you know. Actually, the, sir, the chat box is stopped. So. Okay, the chat box is stopped. Fine, no issues. So you can, one or two of you can just let me know whether you're familiar with this or not. Yes, sir. No, sir. You're familiar with this? Yes? Okay, some of you say yes, some of you say no. Fine. Yes, sir. Let me, okay, fine. Yes, sir. Right. So if I say I'm okay, you're not okay. What is the attitude? Yes, one of you can answer. That I am uh, okay and uh, you are not. Okay. You need to change yourself. I'm perfect. I'm perfect. That means I have a superiority complex. Yes. I'm perfect. I think I'm the best. I'm perfect. So what about yeah, the overconfidence maybe? Of course, of course. That happens. I think I'm perfect. You don't know anything. You're bad. You don't know anything. You're a poor chap, poor fellow. Okay. In the same way, when I say I'm not okay, you're okay. Low self-esteem. Exactly. I'm helpless. I'm Low Yes, exactly. Low confidence, I'm wretched, I'm poor, I'm bad at things, I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, I'm an idiot, I'm stupid. So, I mean, all sorts of, if you have to, you know, translate these attitudes by using certain uh, vocabulary, you can easily do that. You see how many words you'll find when you ask this question to yourself. So, that's, that's the kind of uh, thing. Um, I'm talking about. That way, if I say I'm not okay, you're okay, that means I'm not kind to myself. I'm the cruel most person to me or myself. If I'm cruel to myself, how can I expect the world to be kind to me? So for the world to be kind to me, I have to be kind to myself first. So this can happen only when you begin to listen to yourself. You are in sync with yourself. You are in connection with yourself. So the fourth is, how often do we trust our ability to make the right decision? I mean, this is, this is an everyday question. In the workplace, for every single decision, if you run to your colleague, then you don't have that confidence. You don't have that self-esteem. You don't have, you know, uh, that that air about yourself you don't trust you don't have the trust on yourself if you do not trust your ability then who else will because you'll never trust your ability if you do not trust others will never trust your ability because you always run to others for some kind of support some kind of help when it comes to decision making because you lack confidence you think that and you are very very afraid scared of you know receiving the or owning the blame just for one time say that okay fine i'll make my decision i may go wrong i'll take all the blame but i'll make my own decision and just then break free that that happens and listen to yourself yourself the your inner self is saying something to you believe in your ability and you say, no, no, I can't believe in my abilities because it might lead to embarrassment. It might lead to failure. And I'm very scared of failure and embarrassment or humiliation. So you'll tell your inner person, no, you don't have any ability. Shut up. So the outer person, that's you, your inner and your outer. Your outer will shut your inner person. That's exactly what happens when we lose connection with ourselves because we don't listen to ourselves. So the entire globe is talking about, even you know, this, uh, most uh, organizations these days are talking about uh, spiritual quotient, meditative quotient. What is that? What do they mean by that? What do they mean by staycation? What do they mean by one minute vacation? You might have heard about one minute vacation. Have you heard about one-minute vacation? Quickly? Yes. 
one minute vacation. So if you do not go for that one minute vacation, that one minute vacation allows you to return to yourself because you, you had gone out of yourself. You're doing things externally. If you do it for a long time, you'll be losing connection with yourself. You'll not be listening to yourself. Your inner person will tell you that you're losing contact with yourself. You're getting tired. You're overworking. You're getting stressed. But you'll continue to do that. Your outer person who wants success at any cost will continue to do so. And your inner person will suffer. So that is how you lose connection with yourself. So the most important of it all, do you accept yourself? That's the most important question. Do I accept myself with the issues that I have, with my incompetences? Do I accept myself? Because growth will result from acceptance. When we do not acceptance, no growth is ever possible. So growth will actually emerge from acceptance. So personal growth or personal development will happen only when we accept ourselves. And all this will happen when we begin to know how to listen to ourselves. For example, my outer person asks to my inner person, what are you? Who are you? If I'm able to answer, I mean, as a professional, if I am able to answer, what are your skills? If I'm able to answer, these are my skills. Okay. What are your hobbies? These are my hobbies. What you are good at? This is what I'm good at. How have you overcome a problem of years in the past? This is how I have overcome a problem in the past. So where do you see yourself in the future? Now, oh, why should somebody else from outside ask these questions to you? Your outer self can ask these questions to you and your inner self can answer. So a conversation can go on between the outer self and the inner self. And that's the best form of listening because in that process, you will be discovering more and more about yourself. What are my attitudes? What are my motivations? What things motivate me? What, what are my attitudes? What are my personal values? Everything. So you, you go on speaking to yourself and you're listening to yourself, you're answering. A conversation is happening between the self, two selves. The best form of self-awareness and self-discovery. So unless we do that, we're not ready for the world because we do not understand ourselves. We have never listened to ourselves. So that's why it is very, very important for career growth for professional growth or success, this is the most important thing, listening to oneself. And that's the reason why staycations and one minute vacations, they all are important because you come back to yourself. Because when you look at the biological reality on which our life is based, you'll find that the heart, it is based on a principle that is called the stretch and shrink principle, the stretch and shrink principle. It stretches and then it shrinks. So shrinking naturally follows the stretching process. So stretching is going out, meeting others, interacting with them, listening to them, speaking to them. Shrinking, coming back to oneself, listening to oneself, to be at ease with oneself, to spend some time with oneself, to be kind to oneself, to accept oneself. So that is the power of listening to oneself. Now, the other half, how well do you listen to others? Okay, because once I know myself well, I'll be going out with confidence, I'll be interacting with others. Because, you know, when I asked you to imagine your workplace, you said people. So I, I cannot offer to work in isolation, to work alone. I'll be working with people. So, when I work with people, what kind of uh, listening skills that I need? I need the, this kind of listening skill. And the most important is relational listening skills. Relational, those skills that will strengthen your relationships. Relational 
uh, listening skills. And how will that happen? Only when you begin to reflect. Somebody is telling you something, a speaker is saying a certain thing. And these are some of the possible responses or indicators of thought. These are indicators of thought. Okay, on the left you can find these are indicators of thought. What you're thinking about it. And at the same time, are you able to actually discover the feeling of the speaker? So I hear you saying that you feel sad, you feel confused, you feel happy. So I hear you saying that's one kind of reflection. And then you can also say, I think I hear you saying that. If you're not very confident about it, I think if you want a verification from the speaker, as a listener, you can say, I think I, I hear you saying, or I heard you saying that you feel lonely or you're feeling lonely. So the speaker will verify. Yes, you're right. You heard it right. Or if you're very confident about it, you can say, I heard you saying that you feel lonely. Yeah, right. And then if I hear you correctly, the same word you see, hearing, because you're actually listening to the person. The moment the listener says, if I hear you correctly, if I'm not confused, if I'm not wrong, you say this. Again, the speaker will verify, yes, you are right. You're not confused. Or the speaker will verify and say that, no, no, uh, I didn't mean that. And then, do I hear you say that? You're asking a question this time. Do I hear I say that? That means if I heard it correctly, did you say this? Again, the speaker will verify. You seem to be saying that these are the things. Again, the speaker will verify. So for all such responses, the speaker will ultimately verify. So this is not only a mechanical process of verifying a certain response or, or verifying a certain view, rather, it is a process of building that trust. It's a process of you know, building that uh, relationship. You know, sometimes uh, uh, people think that vulnerability at the workplace, especially emotional vulnerability, is not a good uh, skill. It's not a good thing. It's bad for us. But that's not the case. Emotional vulnerability is one of the most important skills that we can cultivate. For example, when you use such reflective indicators, the speaker will become more and more vulnerable, but that is positive vulnerability. Vulnerable in the sense the speaker will begin to trust you more and the speaker will open up. And that is how you can know the other person far better than you originally knew. The same thing will also happen uh, to you when you are a speaker and somebody else is a listener. You can be vulnerable if that trust element is hatched, it's found. So when we are listening to others, the most important thing is establishing or building trust and it leads to some kind of relationship building. So these skills are called relational listening. Relational listening. Why is it important? Have you heard about recognition hunger? Uh, one or two can respond. Recognition hunger? Quickly, you can respond. Yes. Um, yes, so one or two yes, and then uh, a couple of no's. Of course, to get noticed and values. Recognition hunger is a fundamental hunger. It's not a biological hunger, it's a psychological hunger. It's a fundamental hunger. We all want to be recognized. And what are the different forms of recognition that we generally you know, exchange uh, uh, between people or among ourselves? The kind of recognition that we share. What kind of recognition? So most often we, we generally I mean, use certain 
uh, gestures or gestural um, markers? Uh, no, not necessarily. I'm not talking about performance. I'm not talking about your appraisal. Some, that's a different kind of recognition. That's a technical recognition, okay, or official recognition. But I'm talking about recognition when we are transacting with each other. If you remember while talking about the workplace, I said three important, I talked about three important things, people, environment, and transactions. I'm talking about a recognition that happens during transactions. Somebody is speaking, somebody is listening, somebody is not saying anything, just sending a signal, just sending a message that happens during such transactions. Okay. So recognition is a fundamental need. We all want to be recognized. There is no one who doesn't want to be recognized. If that fundamental need is not fulfilled, we will you know, gradually enter a spiral of silence. We'll lose confidence. We'll lose self-esteem, we'll lose contact with our sense, and we'll you know, be losing almost everything about our sense if recognition is not found. So recognition uh, hunger um, is a very important hunger, and recognition hunger needs to be met with. So I have used certain descriptions which you can read and quickly understand. So it is about recognizing and acknowledging. And it leads to identity formation. For example, a new employee lands an organization, a workplace. What do you think that the employee needs on day one? Yes, you can unmute. One or two of you can unmute and say, what do you think? What according to you? Or you can write in the chat box. What according to you? For example, you are landing your workplace. And it is day one. What do you expect? And that is exactly what most organizations are doing these days. They call it homecoming. That's homecoming. Okay. That is homecoming. You feel as if you are going to your home. They give you that ecosystem, that environment. They welcome you in such a manner that you feel at home. So they give you that. Why? The, the, the reason is you belong to that place. You become a part of that place by choice, not by compulsion or force. So they offer you that environment, that warmth, at the beginning of it so that you feel at home and then you begin to focus on your work with a lot of energy and that leads to identity formation okay that leads to identity formation and that you know helps you form your identity and that leads to acceptance if you remember i talked about accepting oneself you accept yourself yes at least of people know me, they recognize me, they accept me. That will lead to an enhanced self-confidence and self-esteem. The second is, you know, I've talked about it, belonging. Where there is no recognition, there is no belonging. And there is no esteem. So as soon as you are accepted into groups, then you develop greater sense of belonging and esteem. So therefore, recognition hunger needs to be fulfilled. And then it is also built into society. We come across strangers. For example, as an employee, you're going to meet a client for the first time. How do you? Because that, that, that person is your client. You cannot aff afford to lose a client. The more clients uh, you win, the better for your career or your growth, your professional growth. So what kind of mindset would you, you, you carry to the meeting with your client? You're meeting your client for the first time who is a stranger to you. And you all, both are strangers to each other. You do not know each other. So you have to begin by recognizing the client. You have to send recognition signals. Recognition, for example, a smile on your face, a warm handshake, 
Okay, and then allowing the client to speak first. Okay, I mean, for long uh, we have heard about ladies first. Okay, that's a kind of recognition, social recognition. Ladies first. Okay, chivalry, knighthood, all those approaches, all those attitudes, recognition markers. So when you do that, that will lead to some kind of trust building. Once the trust is built, it will be easy for you to enter into the professional uh, transaction or discussion with the client. Before the professional discussion takes place, it's important that the personal discussion takes place. So there's an example. I don't know whether you have watched this film or not. Has anyone watched this? Can you recall? Can you recall? Uh, this is a famous uh, scene from a Bollywood uh, movie, uh, Munna Bhai MBBS, played by Sanjay Dutt and uh, yes, Jhappi. They, they call it Jadu Ki Jhappi, a miraculous hug, Jadu Ki Jhappi. Now that's, that's a classic instance of recognition. When one person is recognizing the other person. When, you know, uh, th that's the reason why I have uh, picked this image from both the angles, both the angles. You can see the face of the person who is recognizing this person. And when that happens, when recognition happens, you can see a sense of belongingness and satisfaction on the face. So you can see the face gesture and you can see a tremendous amount of trust, belongingness, and satisfaction in the face of the person who has been recognized. So the recognition hunger is uh, fulfilled, and that's why the person is at ease with himself and at ease with the others. So recognition hunger can be fulfilled when we begin to li you know, listen to others. And listening is one such skill through which we can actually fulfill a recognition hungers of others. And when we do that, we are transacting with others. When, when we begin to recognize others, that will lead to greater or stronger trust. And when you're listening to others, when you, I mean, if you show those signals that you're recognizing the other person, his or her feelings, approaches, views, opinion, issues, you're sending recognition signals that will lead to trust building. So you are familiar with this, I suppose, because you are doing management. Are you familiar with this? Just let me know. The ego states. Are you familiar with this? The ego states. I'll briefly talk about it. So if you're not familiar, I mean, this is another way in which transactions happen. It's very popularly called transactional analysis, the theory of transaction analysis developed by Eric Byrne. So, you know, the same person can be at different ego states. The parent ego state, I mean, I am, I can be at different ego states at different points in time. So if you are not able to understand my ego state, it might lead to a problem when you begin to communicate with me because I'll, I'll listen it in a bad manner. I'll be a very bad listener. And if I'm a bad listener, I'll reply to you in such a manner that it will definitely lead to some kind of problem, conflict with you as a speaker. So for a speaker, it is very important to understand the ego state of the listener. So in workplaces, it is very important for all the people working in an organization to understand each other's ego states. And how do you do that? By observing the behavior of somebody, the body language of somebody, the gestures, the postures of somebody. So it can be parent ego state. For example, it can either be controlling parent, dominating, for example, one day, on Monday, your boss calls you to his chamber and tells you something in an authoritative manner, commanding manner. 
so you know that the boss is in the controlling parent ego state on Tuesday the boss calls you yes how is life what are you doing very easy friendly then you know that your boss is in the nurturing parent ego state the same person two different ego states so actually most often a failure to understand a failure to sometimes even guess the ego state of the other person leads to failed communications or failed transactions so this is the best ego state the best ego state is this adult an adult mature rational a person who always speaks with some kind of reasoning an adult speaking to an adult is the best form of communication and then this child ego state sometimes you know when you uh, see uh, there are occasions when you see a cup of ice cream or a cone of ice cream you jump yay wow like this what are these expressions you suddenly go to the child ego state even in the office you suddenly go to the child ego state okay you you have a promotion you jump child ego state okay so the second one that is adult ego state is this you always live in the present and you respond to situations through rational thought that means if i'm in the adult ego state when you say something to me i will rationally understand it and then the child ego state it can be very primitive, impulsive, demanding. We all know how, how children behave. So the child ego state can also have two parts. The adaptive child, that means whatever you say, you obey. You come across such people in the workplace. Whatever the boss says, they obey. Yes, sir. Or yes, boss. They are always in the adaptive child ego state. If a person is not in the adaptive child ego state the person is in the free child ego state that's exactly where you make your own decisions okay mother tells the child rohan it is time for you to have lunch no no not now i'll take it afterwards free ego state if rohan is in the adaptive ego state rohan says yes yes i'm coming so that's the difference so, I mean, we, we actually uh, are a part of all these transactions in our everyday lives, but we don't take care of these things. So it's very important that we take care of these things. I'll quickly show you a couple of examples. Complementary transaction, proper transaction. As I told you, it can happen between adult and adult. Okay. For example, one adult, that is one A, says, I noticed you went over budget on eating out this week can we talk about this fine a proper rational statement if the listener is in the adult ego state the listener will say this wow you're right i got a little carried away this month will be more mindful next month or you can also say yes you're right i wanted to talk uh, to you about increasing our budget in this area very mature response similarly a complementary transaction can happen between the parent and the child so person 1c says i feel like shit i feel very bad so the parent can say oh i'll take care of you how can i help see the nurturing parent the child adaptive child so there is a complementary transaction. So there'll be no problem at all. It will be a successful communication. Crossed transaction, problematic transaction. The same statement, person 1A says, okay, adult. From the adult ego state, person 1A says, I noticed you went over budget on eating out this week. Can we talk about this? But person 1A failed to guess that person two is in the child ego state is not in the adult ego state and the child ego state responded as a short form it's a slang you know why are you checking my expenses who the hell are you to check my expenses the communication 
broke. Similarly, this one. The second statement, if you remember, I feel like shit. If the listener is in the adult ego state, you'll definitely give a rational response. Okay, you're fine. There's no problem. You're unnecessarily you know, cribbing about it. So just rest, you'll be fine. You'll be, feel better tomorrow. So person one is speaking from the child ego state. The child needs some support, some emotional support. But the person fails to understand the listener is in the adult ego state and the listener says, you'll be fine tomorrow. A rational reply. So failed transactions. So you can just look around and see how often such things happen. And how often such things happen in formal situations like a workplace. And if we do not listen to each other properly, if we do not you know, understand the ego state of the other person, that will lead to big problems. Now, I'll be, I'll be talking about, and this is the last thing I'll be talking about in this session, healthy and unhealthy ego states. There are other ego states as well, apart from these three ego states. These are unhealthy ego states, thumbs down, you know, unhealthy ego states, selfish ego state, okay, a selfish ego state. You're not bothered about any other person, rather, none else, just you, nobody else, okay, you're not bothered about it. So you're not bothered about your colleagues, their interests, their feelings, their emotions, nothing, you're just bothered about yourself. Selfish ego state. We find such people. They don't care for anybody. Please their ego state. You know, they have just one agenda to please everyone. Okay? To please everyone. At the expense of losing contact with themselves. They just want to please everyone. Okay? And the third, a rebellious ego state which is also unhealthy ego state, rebellious ego state. They don't care for the rules. The pleasers generally you know, show as if they care for the rules. Even if they don't care for the rules, they show. So they always wear a mask. They're not the real ones because they want to please everyone for some gain, some personal selfish gains. The rebellious ego state, you don't care for any rules. You always rebel, you always oppose, you always, you know, there are people in the workplace who oppose whatever you say, they will always oppose. You find such people in the workplace, they will always oppose because they are rebellious, they don't believe in rules. If you say, walk on the left side of the road, they will definitely walk on the right side of the road. They are rebellious. They, they believe in breaking rules. If you ask them to come at nine sharp, they will come at nine one, but they will never come at nine. They believe in breaking rules. Okay. And then, uh, I'm sorry, this is not manipulator. This is manipulator. This is a typographical error. So please overlook that. This is manipulator ego state. They are the, you know, worst kind of villains. There are such people in the workplace. They manipulate. For example, you tell them something very interesting. They will you know, silently listen to what you said, and then they will claim that to be their idea. That they go to the boss and say, I have an idea if you allow me. Yes, go ahead. This is my idea. The boss says, oh, great idea. Go ahead. They, they actually run away with all the credit. They manipulate everything for their own selfish interests. And this is critical ego state. In the critical ego state, you always find problems with others you know, approaches, always find problems. This superiority state. I'm okay, you're not okay. Type ego state, critical ego state. And the enabling ego state. There are some people who believe that they are the most benevolent, charitable ones, and they are always out to help others. Okay, I'll help you. Even if the other person has not asked for any help, they will just be there and they help. Okay. I mean, the Samaritans, they will always help others. They think that by helping others, they are making them empowered, which is not the case. This is also an unhealthy ego state. 
six unhealthy ego states. The other ego state is this. So only healthy ego state is the wise executor. The person who knows the difference between sympathy and empathy. The person who knows the difference between, you know, a trainer and a coach, a facilitator and an instructor. They act as facilitators. They make the other person actually empowered. I can give you an example. Just imagine when a, a young kid learns to ride a cycle. Most often, the father holds the cycle from behind. Okay, they hold the carrier or from behind, and that is how the the kid begins to pedal, begins to move the cycle. After a while, without the knowledge of the child, the parent takes off the hands. The father takes off his hands. The child doesn't realize that, and that is how the kid learns how to, you know, run a cycle. So you are playing the role of a facilitator. You are playing the role of a coach. You are playing the role of the wise executor. That's a very healthy ego state. Such people, they generally help others to come to terms with their problems without telling them that I'm doing you a favor. There's enabling people, they always do that. I'm doing you a favor. Without me, it would not have been possible for you. So the wise executors do not do that. So what I mean to say is when we work in the workplace, any organization, it's very, very important that we keep our eyes open. Ear and eyes open because there is a very interesting type of listening that most people do not think about is called observational listening. Now, most people think, how can an observation be an instance of listening? Yes, it is the most important form of listening, observational listening. When you're observing, a kind of communication is happening. You're seeing a few things and you're gathering information. You're telling yourself that you're seeing those things. Your brain tells you that you're seeing a few things. And that is exactly when you're listening to what you're seeing. So this is one kind of listening skill in which your eyes and your ears are in sync with each other. And that's the best form of listening. And that's the best form of listening for workplace success, observational listening. I mean, it can happen only when we begin to observe ourselves, we begin to observe the others. For example, somebody is in a certain ego state. We are observing that person. We are observing the body language of that person. How does a young child know that the father is very, very angry? When the father returns from the office, the young child knows that the father is very angry. So this is not the right time to demand an ice cream or a chocolate. They keep quiet. Observational listening. First they observe, then they tell themselves that my father is very angry, keep quiet now. So the inner person listens to that and the wise executor tells that, no, don't say anything now. So that's the best form of listening, observational listening. So that is how I end this session. So thank you for listening to me. Okay, I'll now make it open for your comments, your observations, questions and queries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yes, yes, please. So can you share your PPTs? Yes, I'll be sharing my privileges with the organizers. Sir, okay. there, is, there are some queries in the ch chat box, sir. Uh, there are not, uh, I mean, I, I don't see any queries, rather lots of thanks messages. I mean, are they <laughs> playing one, the role one of... One query I'll read it for you, sir. Yeah. What are the strategies that are to be adopted by the middle level management people? Okay, so okay. Now, now I can see a query. Yeah. Uh, let me take that query. Uh, so please uh, go a little slow so that Thank you I don't have to. Okay. Um, yes. All right. Uh, just a moment. Yeah. This is the first query. 
Uh, that's from Siddhakam Bhattacharya. Okay, Siddhakam Bhattacharya so has a query. Uh, what are the strategies that are to be adopted uh, by the middle level management people to overcome ego problem? No, I'm not talking about ego problem. Ego is not at all a problem. You know, ego is not at all a problem until and unless it is used to harm somebody. We are actually talking about ego states. The same person can be at different ego states at different points in time. As I told you, the person can be in the parent ego state, that too in the nurturing parent ego state. If I'm in the nurturing parent ego state and my students come and meet me, I'll definitely show a lot of love for them. I'll nurture them. So for the mid-level uh, management people, it's very, very important that there are two things they come to terms with themselves and that will happen only they, when they begin to listen to themselves because most people don't uh, believe in listening to oneself or themselves and that's exactly where most of the problems occur because they lose contact with themselves their real self and they they begin to play roles that they are not so for mid-level and uh, you know top level management or senior management and uh, middle level management it's very important that they i mean it, it is generally expected of them that they have walked that path they understand they realize and they at least they are at ease with themselves and that is how they can be good leaders otherwise they can't be good leaders okay so And then there is a query uh, from Shweta Kumari. Is there any question, uh, gentle way to interrupt the speaker? Actually, interrupt itself is a blocking activity. So there is no, there is no gentle or there is no way. There is no soft or warm way to interrupt. I mean, I, I can never say that. Uh, can I interrupt you, please? So there's no soft way to interrupt. Interrupting is is not a good idea at all. Okay, so we can only give discourse markers and then we can use uh, um, turns to uh, you know change or shift the conversation. We can use turns or turn-taking strategy um, to shift the conversation. It may happen that uh, one person who begins to say something um, you know, goes on saying and saying. And that will lead to a, a long, um, you know, listening session for you. So that that's not a good idea. Uh, in those occasions, you can use those discourse markers and turn taking, but interrupting is not a good idea. There's no gentle way to interrupt. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm uh, Commander Rajin, sir. Uh, I have uh, a question. Yeah, just a moment. Let me uh, first go through the chat box to find uh, uh, any other uh, uh, yes I heard saying in meeting uh, sorry to interrupt you okay uh, so but that's not a good idea I mean see there are certain uh, there's a response from Prajwal Naik that uh, uh, he has heard in meetings that uh, Sorry to interrupt you, but that's not a good idea. You know, in meetings, all meetings generally begin by defining uh, a certain type of behavior or approach during the meeting. Sometimes these, um, these uh, approaches are well-defined, sometimes I'm structured, and sometimes they're not structured. Since they are practiced in that particular organization or workplace, they are generally you know, understood or internalized. So if your workplace has revised its culture in which a person can interrupt a speaker when the person speaks, that's perfectly fine. There's no such problem. Otherwise, when we uh, talk about the um, universal scenario, this is uh, not a good practice. Uh, right, Prajwal? Yes, now please, uh, I can take the question. Uh, sir, good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, I have a question yes. that during a meeting, 
there are many points where the uh, some issues are discussed so in that if uh, there is some interruption so do we also call that uh, statement uh, uh, blocker uh, i didn't get that actually there's some issue with the audio can you write in the chat box now have you posted your question in the chat box yeah fine i can see it now uh, during a meeting where some issues are being discussed if we intervene would they also be a statement blocker um, see uh, actually it is not about intervening intervening is something uh, different we intervene in order to lend some support so therefore we call it intervention intervention is different from interruption interruption is blocking intervening is not blocking intervening is you know lending some support so when certain issues are being discussed and to be practical we cannot discuss multiple issues in one go during a meeting we generally take them up one by one agenda items so every meeting discusses agenda items one by one agenda item one it is discussed a certain um, you know agreement or resolution is arrived at and then after we go to the next agenda so when some issues are being discussed in a meeting um, if somebody intervenes intervention can take place only when it is invited interruptions are generally uninvited but because nobody will ever invite you to interrupt you're invited to interrupt but people will definitely invite you to intervene and suggest something if it is invited there's no problem at all but then if it is not invited and somebody suddenly begins to intervene that will be treated as an instance of interruption and it will lead to statement blockers because somebody has not finished that person who has the responsibility of speaking has to finish first thereafter somebody can come up with either uh, uh, you know a statement blocker or an oppositional view or anything else so that way so it will be invited otherwise it will be interruption there is a response from anant mishra emphasis on the impact of body language during listening of course of course as i told you in the beginning that these things play a very very important role i talked about para language i hinted at it because we need a couple of sessions to talk about para language the body language during listening that is the most important thing the visual signals not the auditory signals that we send we send more visual signals during the listening process than auditory signals auditory signals are discourse markers mm, yes okay right fine i see these are discourse markers but we send more visual responses and they are more important you're right so there is a response from naveen munappa intervening is providing some knowledge during the meeting regarding of course i said that and interventions are always invited so they are generally invited uninvited interventions are interruptions yes sir i think uh, yeah we can wind up uh, the questions and the responses really show how how much the participants you know uh, enjoyed this session and uh, found it really useful uh, professor mishra had actually started uh, the session by defining the workplace the relevance of listening with regard to transactions in the workplace uh, asking ourselves questions to check whether we are good listeners or not some of the problems related to listening especially the importance of listening to ourselves and understanding ourselves he showed how important that is and he also spoke about relational listening skills recognition hunger listening to others about the different ego states and how you know all these are very uh, strongly related to uh, success in the workplace and uh, we also had very relevant examples coming from post mishra examples that were uh, really very easy to understand and also uh, relate to uh, which really reinforced the concepts that he focused upon during the course of this uh, session so i take this opportunity sir to thank you for being 
a part of this uh, uh, e-workshop for consenting to be the resource person of delivering uh, a really wonderful uh, talk, which, uh, as you can see from the responses, all our participants uh, I'm sure really benefited. From. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank uh, uh, the Directorate of Distance Education, Pondicherry University, for organizing. It's not about you know thanking me, or uh, it's not about I thanking uh, DDE. Uh, but it, it's of course a wonderful thing uh, to come up with. Uh, I organize. I mean, I thank the organizers. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Ramaya is also there on board. Uh, thank you, Professor. Ramaya. Yes, no, yes no. thank you very much. Uh, I, I am up and down. I'm actually watching, and the lecture going really good. Of course, see, yesterday we had about 1150 participants in the lecture. Okay, so, okay, that's great. 1150, you can imagine, of course. And today yeah, we are yeah. yet to see the number, of course. I'll just check out, of course. So it's right, going right. very, very good, of course. I, I am really thankful for all the the resource person. And because uh, it is just because of uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Jakaria, who picked up uh, the people from different, different, actually, the institutions who are really a renowned uh, the resource person. And I would like to thank you for sparing your valuable time at least to helping our students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank and you. I thank all the participants for showing yes. a great amount of patience. Listen yes, to yes. me. They are all actually all working the class, and they have a yes. lot of interest. Of course. Unfortunately, nobody is helping them. That is the reason. And we That's are true. taking actually initiative of doing this. Because this is not actually right. part of our teaching. It is, it is out of our interest that we are doing that. And uh, we are at this university the first to conduct job uh, job fairs, and we are regularly conducting the job fairs to the the distance education students also. Many more things which we are doing because this is a celebrable year, and because of that actually we are doing many uh, things which normal universities are not actually doing. Yes, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So, uh, would you please allow me to leave yeah, now? Sure, sir. Sure. Thank yeah, you very sure. much. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much.